Welcome and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Okay, thank you, Mattel. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, before I say anything, I should say that uh, I did teach a course uh, using Zoom before, not many times, but I did it. Uh, but uh, this is the first time that I'm teaching a non-trivial uh, course uh, via Zoom. Uh, please uh, don't tell that to my students who took uh, linear algebra last uh, semester, uh, that, that it was trivial. Uh, they would probably disagree with that statement, but uh, never mind that. So, uh, you know, I basically, uh, I, I have no doubt that we are going to have some technical glitches, uh, but let's, let's try to see how it works. Um, so I'm uh, very enthusiastic about uh, doing this. Uh, uh, let's see, so we still have one minute uh, before uh, this officially starts. Uh, oh yes, I should say uh, that, uh -huh, so this actually reminds me that we don't kill on me, this is alarm. Uh, uh, let me uh, just say that, that uh, you know, at different schools, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, means uh, different things. Uh, at York, uh, 9 a.m. means 9 a.m. Uh, so, so my guess is uh, that, that some students will uh, keep on showing up uh, up to 9, 9.15, uh, even uh, thinking they were not late. So I'll try to make a slow start uh, right now. And uh, let's see, so, so, you know, I know quite a few of you, uh, so I know that, that uh, backgrounds uh, uh, very wildly. I'll try to make it uh, best so that, that uh, nobody falls asleep and uh, everybody can follow. Uh, wish me luck. Uh, that, that's quite uh, uh, quite an ambitious uh, goal. Uh, now, uh, in order to make sure that uh, nobody falls uh, behind too much, uh, I'll, I need your cooperation. So please uh, use chat uh, to ask questions. Uh, I'll keep my eye on the chat. Uh, if, uh, if I'm not, uh, if I seem to be ignoring your chat, then that's because I forgot to keep eye on the chat. Uh, in which case, please uh, just unmute yourself and, and uh, let me know uh, what the question was. Uh, also, uh, let's see. So, so these classes are supposed to run for 90 minutes uh, at York. Typically that means 75 minutes uh, but we'll probably stay longer every now and then. Uh, and also I'll stay around uh, after the class is over, just in case you have some questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Uh, we can think of it as, as office hour. And uh, needless to say, you can email me if you have any questions. In addition to all that, uh, Said Gassemi uh, kindly agreed to run tutorials uh, for this course. Uh, I should say that, that Said actually proved some of the theorems that I'll be presenting. So, so you would be in good hands uh, uh, with him. Uh, Said, do you want to say a few words? Oh, hi, Ilias. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I, um, it's my pleasure. And uh, yeah, I would um, think about some hours for the tutorial. I'll write to everyone. And uh, if they agree, we can agree on some time once a week uh to meet um i haven't decided at what time i guess it depends also on everybody so um i'll i'll try to write to everyone and fix it okay thank yeah. you Sid. and yeah. uh don't forget that you're in eastern standard time zone so it is uh, uh, 2 a.m for you but but uh but it's it's, it's not, not the case with quite a few of the others so so uh, okay yeah that, that's what i was thinking I, I should be non-trivial but i think in the evening or something that's so will be uh, yeah okay okay great uh, thank you uh okay so without further ado i'll just uh, start uh, right now and again um let me just give you a short uh, breakdown of uh, what is the plan so you may have seen uh, the plan uh, for the classes uh, I'll try to follow it uh, as closely as, as reasonable. Uh, that said, uh, I may decide that that uh, plan was unreasonable and that I should speed up or slow down. And again, I need your cooperation uh, to let me know uh, whether I should speed up or slow down. Um, okay, so, so let's, let's start. I hope that you can see my slides. As I said before, uh, the 
set theoretic prerequisites required here are empty set, uh, really. Uh, and uh, this slide is really the only slide uh, today that is going to have any set theory. If you don't know what an ordinal is, uh, don't worry. Basically, ordinal, sorry, just to start counting. And once you get to infinity, you just continue counting. That, that, that's all you need to know, really, for now. Um, so, so this is, uh, well, uh, definitely not the only uh, definition introduced by, by von Neumann that we'll see in this course, but uh, it is the only one from set theory. So he was, among other things, the person who figured out uh, what is the right definition for set theoretic universe. It's this uh, cumulative hierarchy. Let me try. Uh, uh, the alpha, alpha indexed by ordinals. So how it starts? Well, uh, V0 uh, is the empty set. If you know what V alpha is, you take power set of, of V alpha, which means in particular that uh, Vn, its cardinality, is 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 2 n times. So, so these uh, sizes are uh, growing very, very, very quickly. And uh, once you get, uh, as I said, uh, limit ordinal, you just take union of what you had so far and continue. And uh, this name V is, is a sort of uh, descriptive because the way that it looks like is really well, like a giant letter V. You see V, V0 is uh, this empty set at the bottom. V1 is slightly bigger, V2 is even bigger and so on. Uh, once you get to, to V omega, so to me, omega is uh, the first uh, limit ordinal, uh, mostly interchangeable with the set of natural numbers. Then just take union and go on. So here is V omega plus one, V omega plus two and so on. Now, uh, if you remember uh, from your analysis course, uh, how one defines uh, different uh, number systems, um, for natural numbers, again, there is a nice definition by von Neumann. And you can see that natural numbers belong uh, all to V omega. Uh, once you get to V omega, you define rational numbers as, as uh, equivalence classes of pairs. And then you define real numbers as Dedekind cuts uh, and so on. And the reason why I'm saying all this is that, that most of mathematics really takes place in V omega plus some sufficiently large number. Let's say V omega plus 10. Uh, if you're doing something outside, uh, you, you're either a set theorist or category theorist or using non-trivially uh, one of those uh, two subjects. Um, now, uh, what that means is really that, that uh, if you look at, at uh, this uh, big set, and you know, these ordinals go quite high, uh, that basically everything is happening right here. So, so you may wonder uh, why bother uh, introducing all this uh, if, if you don't really need uh, uh, or, or it, apparently you don't need it. Well, uh, the fact is that uh, what happens at some very, very high uh, cardinals, uh, called large cardinals, actually affects in a profound way what happens uh, all the way down there. So even if you just care about uh, only about uh, real numbers or separable c algebra or something like that, uh, Still, uh, what is happening in set theoretic universe quite high up may affect uh, what uh, uh, what you are doing, uh, and uh, you know because of that uh, it is uh, good to have this. Now, one analogy that, that you may be familiar with uh, is analytic number theory. Right, so statements about uh, natural numbers are proved by using complex analysis, which means in terms of, of this. Uh, cumulative hierarchy, you're working inside V omega, sorry, uh, you're proving statements about V omega, but working inside something like V omega plus uh, three or, or so, uh, and really non-trivial using complex analysis. So it, it's like that, uh, but, uh, but a bit more drastic. Anyway, uh, let's not worry about set theory for now. Let's move on uh, to, uh, to see algebras. Uh, and, uh, just to remind you, I'm uh, keeping an eye on the chat. Oh yes. I should say one thing. I hope that uh, everybody is in now, uh, I'll be using my, uh, book, um, uh, combinatorial set theory and C algebras, uh, for this course. Uh, if you don't have a copy, let me know. I'm happy to share a PDF file of the book. Uh, and uh, I should say that it's even legal. My, my contact with Springer allows me to do that. So uh, there is no shady business here. Uh, now, 
I should say also uh, that uh, there is, uh, right, so the first theorem for this course uh, that I learned uh, many years ago from uh, Dragan Blagojevic uh, states that uh, every uh, mathematical book uh, contains uh, infinitely many typos. And proof is by induction. So every time you read it again, uh, there is another typo. And uh, my book is not an exception. So it, it, it's not a counterexample to this theorem. Uh, but I'm maintaining uh, web page uh, on my web page uh, with uh, with basically a list of typos found so far, uh, so you can check it out. Uh, actually, even some of them uh, will, will uh, uh, something that I'm going to say today or, may, or maybe on Friday uh, is um, wasn't entirely correct. So anyway, uh, let's let's uh, go. So uh, prerequisites uh, by each. I'm always going to uh, denote Hilbert space. Uh, now Hilbert space uh, means a complex Hilbert space. I want my operators to, to, to satisfy spectral theorem. Uh, in other words, L2 of some index set I, uh, this index set is going to be countable for most of the time. So, so think uh, little L2 or big L2 if you prefer, uh, no difference really. Uh, B of H uh, is the algebra of all uh, bounded linear operators uh, on uh, Hilbert space H, and uh, it is a Banach algebra with involution uh, given by the adjoint operation um, and abstract ceased algebras are just complex Banach algebras with an involution that satisfy uh, this equality, norm of A A star is equal to norm of A squared. This is in addition to axioms of Banach algebras. Uh, I don't want to say what those are. If, if you're not sure what they are, they are just natural axioms that, that um, you have to, they have to satisfy. Uh, a different definition is concrete ceased algebras. And they are defined as norm closed self adjoint subalgebras of some B of H. Uh, H uh, in this case uh, can be non separable, so arbitrary Hilbert space H. Uh, it is uh, an exercise uh, in uh, operator theory to prove that concrete C algebra is also an abstract C algebra. You just have to, to check uh, that the C star equality is uh, satisfied. Um, but uh, the, the fascinating effect uh, is uh, that the converse is true. And uh, that, that is a theorem of uh, Gelfand and Neimark, uh, which is uh, G and N, uh, that uh, every abstract algebra is isomorphic to a concrete cyst algebra. Uh, now, oh yes, uh, you can see here that this is theorem 1101. So I'll be uh, using my book uh, for the course and uh, all the references that I give here are references to that book. Uh, not because uh, you cannot find a better write-up of any of these theorems elsewhere. You probably can for this one, I'm sure you can, but it's uh, just easier to refer to the same place uh, all the time. And also uh, after the lecture, I'm going to post uh, these slides. Uh, so, so you're basically you know, combining slides in the book uh, it should be uh, reasonably easy to, to get around. Uh, so, so this is a beautiful proof, uh, very clever idea, uh, but uh, we just don't really need that proof. So I'll just uh, go forward. You can either learn the proof or, uh, well, unless you know it already, or just take this for granted. Um, now, what about uh, examples? Well, uh, Let's look at uh, abelian uh, ceased algebras first. So there is another uh, theorem also of Gelfman Neimark from the same paper, uh, which characterizes exactly what uh, abelian ceased algebras are. And uh, here is uh, what they are. You just take some compact Hauser space X, uh, look at all continuous functions from X into the complex numbers. Uh, the the Operations are defined pointwise, pointwise addition, pointwise multiplication. Um, the adjoint is just pointwise conjugation. And the norm, the norm is, is the supremum norm. So a norm of some f is just supremum uh, over uh, absolute values of f of x for all x in x, or you can take it as maximum. This is a complex Hauser space. And a uh, remarkable fact is that uh, this exhausts all abelian 
unital uh, cyst algebras. By unital, I mean uh, they have a multiplicative unit, uh, which corresponds to the identically uh, one function. Uh, it is actually an exercise, uh, if you haven't seen this before, uh, to see that, that uh, C of X is isomorphic to a concrete cyst algebra. Uh, if you haven't done this, you can think about it uh, for a moment. Uh, and another uh, theorem, which is a consequence of the Gelfand-Einberg theorem and its proof, is uh, best uh, formulated in category theoretic um, terms. Uh, if you look at the category of unital abelian cyst algebras, so they are all of the form C of X or C of Y, uh, it is equivalent to the category of compact Hausdorff spaces. So uh, from C of X, you can recover this space X, from C of Y, recover Y, and every star homomorphism from C of X to C of Y corresponds to a map from Y to X. And uh, this behaves in the way that you would expect it to behave. Uh, this map is uh, injective, if and only this map is surjective, and so on. Uh, so because of this, uh, quite often, uh, uh, theory of cyst algebra is considered as a non-commutative topology. Uh, well, obviously, people who, who uh, define this uh, care about compact Hausdorff spaces, arguably those are the, the most important um, uh, topological spaces. So, uh, so, so we have a clue of categories, and we'll be coming back uh, to this fact uh, every uh, now and then. Um, so again, uh, this is uh, if your algebra has a unit. Uh, if it doesn't have a unit, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Let me know if there are any questions. So I'm keeping my eye on the chat. No, no questions so far. Um, oh yes, right. So, so this was supposed to be a blank slide. So anyway, uh, I don't think. Uh, now uh, here is another lemma. Uh, it talks about arbitrary ceased algebras that every algebraic star homomorphism between ceased algebras is contractive. Now, uh, one uh, bit about um, uh, terminology, uh, when uh, operator algebra is, say, contractive, uh, what they mean is what uh, pretty much everyone else means by one Lipschitz. So, so, so contractive means that at, if distance between X and Y is at most one, then the distance between P of X and P of Y is also at most one. Uh, which means that, that, you know, forget about fixed point theorems. Oh, yes. So uh, Najla uh, uh, has raised the hand. So I, I don't, ah, huh, okay, I see. I, I don't even see the hands. Oh, yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Christina, for, for letting me know. Uh, Najla, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, I was seeing this little hand up with number one next to it, but, but, but I was just wondering, oh. What is this? So uh, anyway, uh, Nadja, uh, just let me know if you have a question, you can type it. I guess it wasn't on purpose. Uh, all right. So, uh, so so this is a remarkable fact. You see, if, if you're a set theorist, if you know something about set theory and Banach algebras, you know that, that for example, question whether uh, algebraic homomorphism between Banach algebras uh, is continuous is actually independent uh, from the axioms of set theory. So, so nothing like that uh, in case of cyst algebras. Uh, okay, and uh, corollary is that uh, if your star homomorphism is in addition injective, if just its kernel is trivial, it's automatically an isometry. So uh, this is uh, this again further simplifies uh, the theory of uh, cyst algebras. All right, so uh, convention, I'll be using capital uh, letters, Latin letters, ABC for cyst algebras, little ABC for their elements. And by B, let's we put an A, I'll uh, mean B is a C star subalgebra of A. Well, I guess you'll, you'll be seeing a lot of this, you'll get used to it. Uh, Okay, now, uh, as I said, I'll be posting my slides to my homepage, uh, which means that, that you don't have to memorize uh, this right now. Most of this slide is here uh, just for future reference. We'll not even be using, I don't think I'm ever going to need quite so much this anyway. Uh, this is uh, just a copy from my book. 
Um, so uh, here uh, we have a cyst algebra A and we have uh, operator little a in A. Uh, we say that it is normal if it commutes with its adjoint. So this is just like in linear algebra. Self adjoint if it is equal to its uh, uh, adjoint. Now uh, it is good to, to, to think about uh, matrices, right? So, so the, the example uh, number one of cyst algebras is n by n matrices. Even for two by two matrices, uh, that there are many non-trivial things that one can say. So, so uh, just think about uh, matrices here, right? So self adjoint is same as Hermitian matrix and uh, so on. Uh, projection, if a square is equal to a star equal to a, and so on. So uh, I'll just need uh, these uh, for today. Oh yes, so one more, contraction. So uh, complying with, um, um, with, with uh, what I said about contractions. So contraction is an operator whose norm is less or equal than one. Uh, and uh, here is uh, another thing that that uh, that uh, we'll be using a lot. Uh, if you have a non-unital cyst algebra, okay, uh, maybe I should give an example of of non-unital cyst algebra. So if you fix a Hilbert space H, and K of H is all uh, operators on the Hilbert space H such that A is compact. Now, in other words, uh, what this means is that uh, if you look at uh, the image of the unit ball uh, of your Hilbert space, uh, this is uh, weakly compact, uh, compact in the weak topology of, of the Hilbert space. Uh, or another way equivalently uh, to say this is that this is the norm closure of all operators uh, whose uh, rank is finite. So uh, this algebra doesn't have units uh, if H is, is uh, infinite dimensional. And uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, good to, to have units in your cyst algebras. And one defines unitization of a cyst algebra A, uh, A tilde. Uh, so basically you just artificially add, add a unit. Uh, so so uh, as a set, uh, this is set of all uh, sums where uh, you have elementary algebra and the scalar. Now uh, addition and adjoint are defined in the way that you would think they have to be defined. And so is multiplication. Although I wrote here the formula, this is uh, what, what uh, multiplication has to be. The only remaining question is how to define a norm. You see, because this A and lambda, you don't know anything about their relation. Uh, so uh, after a little bit of thinking, uh, it should be clear that this is the right way to go. The norm of A plus lambda is supremum over all uh, B uh, elements of the algebra of norm at most one of A, B plus lambda B. Note uh, this here is an element of our cyst algebra. So basically this works. Um, and uh, another uh, thing uh, to keep in mind is if you have unital cyst algebra, such as uh, N by N matrices, if you unitize it, you get uh, another unit on top of it. So really, uh, unit depends uh, on the context, uh, but we don't have to uh, worry about uh, that right now. Uh, here is a uh, definition. The spectrum of an operator in a cyst algebra is defined. So this is why we needed unitization. I want a unit here. Uh, so uh, look at all scalars such that a minus a lambda i is not invertible in a tilde. And now I see there is a typo. Uh, so uh, here we just, we don't really want a tilde. So uh, if a is unital already, we just take a. So a if a is unital, because otherwise you would end up uh, with zero in spectrum of everything. So again, linear algebra. Right. Uh, just think about the diagonalization of matrices. Uh, first thing that you do is find the eigenvalues. Well, uh, eigenvalues uh, are element of the spectrum. It is more complicated than that, uh, but, but, but basically uh, this provides a good uh, intuition. Can I ask a question? Yes, definitely. Yes, go ahead, Matel. Yeah, just uh, if you take uh, a sister algebra of matrices and you unitize it, you change the dimension, what happens? Uh, 
uh, yes, a dimension grows by one. You see, you're just, just adding a one dimensional space, right? So, so basically okay. think of it, if you have n by n matrices, you're really embedding them into n plus one by n plus one matrices, but you're just adding a scalar at, at the bottom right corner. One element in the diagonal. Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, you know, on uh, elsewhere, uh, these new elements are zero everywhere. This is a subalgebra. You can just check it's closed under addition, multiplication, and adjoint. OK, thanks. Thank you for asking. So, so please uh, don't be shy. Uh, I mean, everybody. Uh, so uh, here is a fact uh, which is not trivial at all, but it is good exercise if you haven't seen it. Uh, if you have a subalgebra of A, and uh, it is what is called a unital subalgebra, um, namely, uh, two algebras have the same unit, which is not like uh, in this example here, then if you have an element of the smaller algebra, right? So here it is, right? So here is B, here is A, here is little b inside B, then their spectra are equal. So the spectrum doesn't depend uh, on uh, the context in which you're defining this. Uh, this is uh, not uh, true in general for, for, for Banach algebras. So, uh, one, impl one uh, inclusion is easy, the other one you actually need to do something non trivial. So, uh, I'll just uh, leave it uh, to you to, to, to keep in mind. But, but basically, spectrum uh, is unchanged. Uh, and you see, this is you need this assumption that, that it's the same unit because uh, if unit of B is not the same as unit of A, then you necessarily add zero to every spectrum. But that's all that that's going on. So, so. Um, so even without this uh, unital assumption, uh, the only difference between two spectra can be uh, whether zero is there or not. There is much more to say, but uh, the only reason why I'm saying all this is uh, in this title, Continuous Functional Calculus, uh, one of the most uh, useful and beloved uh, methods in CIST algebras. Uh, so, um, right, so, so, so uh, just to, to, to say what it is, I need one more definition. C star of S is the C star algebra generated by a set of operators S. So whenever I write C star of S, uh, S is going to be either a subset of some B of H or subset of some fixed C star algebra. And uh, we are defining uh, this inside the context. And uh, also if I have just one element A, I'll drop uh, these uh, curly brackets and C star of little a is C star of this. And, and you know, you can you guess uh, all sorts of combinations if I have two elements and so on, what C star of something means. It's going to be always uh, completely clear uh, from the context. Okay, so, so, so basically uh, the reason why I'm saying all this is uh, uh, we want to understand uh, what is C star generated by a single element. In general, we don't know, uh, but uh, if that element is normal, then, then we actually have complete information about what is going on. Remember, normal means commutes with its adjoint. Uh, and right, so, so I promised before this definition, uh, here, X is uh, locally compact, Hausdorff. Locally compact, but, but no, not compact. So C0 of X is all uh, continuous functions from X uh, into complex numbers, uh, which vanish at infinity. So, so this is uh, just my lazy way of saying that for every epsilon, there is a compact subset of X so that outside of that compact set uh, function uh, is uh, less than epsilon in norm. A set depends of course uh, on, uh, on X. So, uh, and uh, the second part of the alpha Nymark theorem, uh, the non-unital C algebras all look like this. Okay, and here is a continuous functional calculus. So if A in A is normal, again, that means A star A is equal to A A star, then C star algebra generated by A is just C zero of the spectrum of A minus zero. So of course, if, if zero is not in a spectrum of A, you don't have to say that. Uh, but uh, if uh, zero is in a spectrum, uh, this is going to be a non-unital C algebra. So you see, but by just knowing what a spectrum of, of uh, an element is, you know exactly what uh, what algebra it generates, assuming it's normal. Uh, you know, if, if A is not normal, uh, then 
we are in complete dark. Um, but let's not worry about that. And uh, moreover, uh, isomorphism is as natural, natural as you can expect. So here, uh, this is the identity uh, function on the spectrum of A. A spectrum of A is some, some subset of complex numbers. So you just look at identity function on that, that goes to A. Now, uh, once you know where that goes, because A generates the algebra, you know everything because you have uh, all the polynomials in A and A adjoint, that they go where they have to go. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, this extends to arbitrary continuous functions on the spectrum. So uh, if A is normal, and if f is a continuous function from spectrum of A into complex numbers, then you can define f of A in here. So this is cis algebra generated by A and one. I'm just throwing in uh, the unit so that I don't have to worry about removing uh, zero from the spectrum. So we're talking about unit of cis algebras. Uh, and uh, so, so we can define uh, f of A, which means, for example, if you, you, know, if you can define something like exponential of A, this you could actually do in arbitrary Banach algebra by uh, just a power series. Uh, but uh, more interestingly, for example, if, uh, if spectrum of A is subset of the real numbers, then you can define absolute value of A uh, by just applying absolute value uh, to, 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 to this. And uh, you know, it can define square root and uh, uh, whatnot. So, uh, so, so, so we'll be coming back to, to this uh, over and over and, and over. Uh, and uh, here is a useful triviality that I'll uh, need later on. Uh, if A is normal, and if we have continuous function on the spectrum of A, then uh, the norm is just a soup norm, because uh, this is how, how we define norm on, on C of X, right? So this is supremum over all X in X, of the absolute value of f of x. Uh, in particular, f of a is zero if and only if f of lambda, if, if uh, f vanishes on the spectrum. Now, uh, why is uh, this useful? Well, you see, if, if you assume that your operator is normal, then it is self-adjoint, namely equal to this adjoint, if and only if its spectrum is subset of r. Again, you need the assumption that A is normal. It is a projection, then we satisfy these algebraic equations, if and only if its spectrum is a subset of zero, one. Right, zero and one are the only two solutions uh, to the system of equations. A is a unitary, namely A star is A star A is equal to one. So the adjoint is the inverse, if and only if its spectrum is subset of the unit circle in complex numbers, right? These are the complex numbers which satisfy these equations and so on. So again, uh, this is, uh, one cannot uh, overstate how useful this is, uh, but we can say a little bit more. So um, uh, if, if you have an operator somewhere in some cis algebra, which is within epsilon limit adjoint, then there is a self adjoint element in the algebra generated by A, which is within epsilon limit. And the proof is uh, just take just take a plus a star over two and check it works, All right? So this is self-adjoint uh, and the difference is going to have norm uh, less than epsilon. Uh, more interestingly, so every approximately self-adjoint element is close to, to a self-adjoint element. Uh, more uh, interestingly, uh, and I'll leave this to you as an exercise, for every epsilon, uh, there is a delta small enough so that for every a, if a is approximately a projection. You see what, what, what uh, this equation says is uh, that A almost satisfies the requirements for being a projection. Then you can actually find the projection in the algebra generated by A, which is within epsilon of A. Uh, delta has been computed. Uh, I'm just lazy and it makes no difference for us what it is. For us, all that matters is that there is a delta small enough. Um, yeah, we may want Basically, it is application of uh, continuous functional calculus. Uh, let me know if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, right, so another uh, very important uh, notion in CIST algebras, which is actually at the heart 
of the proof of uh, the Gelfand-Neimark uh, uh, Seagull theorem GNS representation positivity. So uh, in cis algebras, one can uh, define uh, positive operators. Let me just say one thing. You see, self-adjoint operators, you can think of them as, as uh, you know, non-commutative real numbers sitting inside the, your cis algebra. Cis algebra is non-commutative complex numbers. Well, uh, what are the positive elements? Uh, the, there are two ways to, to define them. Uh, and uh, it is not trivial. If you haven't seen a proof, it is not trivial. Uh, the, the weights are equivalent. First one is, uh, you just say that A is positive if it is equal to B star B for some B in A. Second, uh, A is self-adjoint and its spectrum is subset of the positive numbers. There's also a third way asking that, that uh, for, I mean, if you think about concrete operator on Hilbert space, you want that C, C is an element, it, it is a vector in Hilbert space, that uh, A C inner product with C is greater or equal than zero for every C. So this is uh, equivalent, uh, which is normally what, what positive is defined. Now, uh, why do we care about positive operators here? Uh, we'll see in a moment. Uh, let me just say, so uh, A S A, uh, there is something wrong with the font here, I'll fix that is uh, all uh, self-adjoint elements. Uh, this is a real Banach space, subset of ceased algebra. And exercise, uh, every element of ceased algebra is a linear combination of self-adjoint element and uh, I times self-adjoint element. We already saw what the self-adjoint one is, A plus A star over two. And uh, the, the skew adjoint par is something like one over two i, I think. Um, I always forget this one. I think a star minus a. All right. Oh, okay, yeah. As I said, I always forget this. Uh, uh, here, it is i times a minus a star. This here is self adjoint. Uh, so uh, this is quite often if you need to prove something about all elements of ceased algebras, it suffices to do it for all self-adjoint elements. And by uh, continuous functional calculus, you can even take absolute values and uh, write uh, every self-adjoint as difference of two positive operators. Uh, well, I'll just leave that to you. I guess I basically told you um, what to do. Now, uh, why do we care about positivity? Uh, as I said, uh, it is at the heart of the proof of uh, gelfand neimark civil representation uh, theorem, but we'll not need to go there really. Uh, what we'll need uh, here is uh, that uh, self-adjoint operators can be ordered by uh, saying that A is less or equal than B if and only if B minus A is uh, positive. And I'll need a few uh, easy facts about uh, this notion, so let's just take a look. So first lemma, if A is less or equal than B, then for any C, C A C star is less or equal than uh, C B C star. And now uh, the reason for this, I'll just sketch a proof here. So if you write uh, B minus A as uh, D star D, then uh, C times B minus A C star is C D star, uh, okay, so I, I, I put uh, adjoints, okay, so I like it, C D star times uh, D C star, and this you can rewrite as D C star star times D C star, so, so it is greater equal to zero. And uh, then you can rearrange this. Uh, Somewhat more interesting, uh, if uh, A is less or equal than B, then the norm is less or equal than B. Uh, to prove this one, actually, I just have to go to, uh, it has to go to, to the fact that, that uh, you know, C star algebra, actually, okay, I'll just write it. So the norm of A is just the maximal value uh, of uh, the element of, of spectrum of A, if A is normal. 
uh, this follows from continuous functional calculus, uh, if, if you want. So, so basically, uh, that implies the first inequality. The second inequality is slightly trickier. Uh, so this is one of those uh, things that, that are completely obvious. So of course, uh, if A is less equal than B, then AC should be less equal than BC in the norm. But one has to be careful uh, because AC and BC are not necessarily self-adjoint. So the ordering doesn't make sense. Uh, one has to prove inequality and the trick is to use C star equality. So I'll, I'll leave it to you basically, you just have to use C star equality and combine it uh, with the first part of the lamp. All right, so yet another uh, result of, of the von Neumann. Uh, here, A is an arbitrary operator and the absolute value of A is defined as A star A to one half uh, this makes sense because a star a is positive, uh, square root uh, is a continuous function on positive reals. So uh, this is a well-defined operator. Uh, and uh, the theorem uh, is uh, this uh, polar decomposition. For any operator in B of H, there is a partial isometry V in B of H. Now, uh, what partial isometry means is uh, that uh, V star V is a projection. This implies that VV star is a projection as well, uh, which satisfies A is equal to VA. Now, uh, this uh, should look familiar. Uh, think of polar decomposition of uh, complex numbers, right? Z is e to i theta times rho. Uh, you have um, the, uh, the, the, the unitary part uh, and the positive part of every complex number. Uh, so uh, construction of these not difficult, it requires a few tricks, but uh, tricks are such uh, that, that they work in B of H. They don't work in an arbitrary C algebra. So uh, you don't have polar decomposition in an arbitrary C algebra. And uh, to see that uh, there is a well, compact operators, for example, uh, Inside the algebra of compact operators, there is an operator which has no polar decomposition in the compact operators. It has polar decomposition in B of H. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it to, to think about it. it, it it's it's uh, not uh, difficult, basically. Um, any questions so far? Let me know if I'm going too far or too slow. So I guess uh, I'm sure that there are people who, who, who think that I'm going too fast and people who, are, who think I'm going too slow. But again, I'll, I'll hang out uh, after uh, the class. So, uh, so if it was too fast, uh, we can uh, slow it down. Uh, and uh, here is an exercise for you uh, that uh, basically it goes in opposite direction from the example. If you have uh, any element A of some C-star algebra and if you give me epsilon, no matter how small, then there is an X in C-star of A uh, which is a contraction and which almost satisfies uh, this equation uh, from polar decomposition. So if you could only make those axes converge to something, you would get a polar decomposition uh, of element A, but you cannot. Uh, that, that's what uh, example in context uh, shows. So uh, there is a hint here, uh, which is a very useful uh, consequence of uh, continuous functional calculus, that every function in C0 of spectrum of A minus zero, uh, you see, you can apply that function to absolute value of A and then multiply by this, this U is coming from, uh, U is V. Okay, so U is coming from polar decomposition of A and uh, this belongs to C star of A. So, uh, so yeah, I'll just leave it to you to, do, uh, to work it out. And, uh, okay, some more notation. Uh, now, uh, first, A sub one, uh, I used to denote uh, the norm unit ball of C algebra A. Uh, different authors use uh, all sorts of combinations. I've seen A in su superscript and then everywhere. So I'll stick to, to, uh, to uh, subscripts. Um, A plus, uh, this is standard notation, 
all self adjoint elements which are greater than zero. And, and the last one is very specific uh, to my book. So A plus one, it's the positive part of the unit sphere. So it's those elements which are positive, which have more exactly one. It is for some reason that are going to be obvious later on. Uh, this is going to be important uh, set uh, for us. Uh, okay, so approximate units. So here is uh, something. So you see, you have unital C algebra, so you have ones which are not unital, well, uh, like, like compacts. Uh, even the ones which are not unital uh, contain some, um, oh, have uh, something called approximate unit, which is very useful in many situations. And uh, we'll need it uh, in our first uh, non trivial theorem. We'll need approximate units with some extra properties. So I'll go through the trouble of actually proving this is a theorem of Dix Mies. So it's one of the classical results about these algebras. Uh, okay, so, so its definition uh, approximate unit in A is a net. Uh, so here, capital lambda is some index set. Think, you know. Sometimes you can get away with, with natural numbers, but some directed set. Uh, so it's net of positive contractions so that it, uh, for every element A in A, E lambda A converges to A in the norm. Uh, not everybody agrees that, that uh, one should require positive contractions here. You'll see, I mean, you just have to be careful if you're reading something in literature, uh, some author just, just require a net. But, I just find it easier to, to require positive contractions. Uh, we'll see uh, very soon why is this useful. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, I want to sketch a proof. Uh, so this is a big experiment I mentioned. Every C algebra has an approximate unit. And moreover, if A is separable, then it has a sequential approximate unit. Uh, I guess uh, terminology is self-explanatory. It is a approximate unit which is accountable uh, just countable increasing sequence. Uh, okay, so uh, proof, any questions? So uh, here is uh, the first uh, trick. Uh, if A has norm less than one and it sits in some unit of ceased algebra, then one minus A is invertible. So uh, this is a standard trick. It even has a name, I think it's called Neumann series. But uh, basically the trick is uh, the inverse. You just write down what it has to be. Some n goes from zero to infinity of a to the nth power. Uh, now, because norm of a is less than one, this is norm convergent, right? So this sum makes sense. It converges to norm in every ceased algebra. Uh, and if you multiply it by one minus a, uh, you get uh, so-called telescoping uh, and you're just left uh, with one. So uh, elements, so, so I mean, this has more consequences. Uh, it can be used to prove that uh, invertible elements form an open subset, but we just need this. And here is a definition. So, so lambda uh, is the set of all positive operators whose norm is strictly less than one. And I claim that, that this set is directed under less unit. Now, uh, if you think it's obvious, uh, think again, uh, you see, uh, this is uh, ordering uh, on self adjoints uh, is notoriously uh, messy. Uh, they, they don't form a lattice. So even in two by two matrices, you can find two positive matrices so that, that there is no maximum. Of course, that, that there you can just add them up and get something bigger, but, but uh, this is a very ill behaved uh, ordering. So, um, so before I proceed to prove this, uh, let me just uh, say why, why, why do we matter? Well, you see, because this is directed, I can just use this whole thing as an approximate unit. You'll see that, that in a moment. So let's prove uh, that, that lambda is directed using uh, part one. So this was actually part two, was supposed to be two here. Uh, okay, so, so here is the trick. Uh, we define a transformation from lambda to a plus a goes to one minus a inverse minus one. Now this is well defined uh, because uh, norm of a is less than one. So this is indeed invertible. And uh, now you can check that, I mean, if you just ignore this minus one for a moment, uh, this is a monotonic uh, function. 
because taking minus uh, reverses order, taking inverse reverses order once again. So this is monotonic and it's order isomorphism. Why? Well, you just need to, to know, uh, I forgot what they call it, psi, maps a plus the lambda. Uh, what is the inverse function? Well, uh, you just say psi of some b is, let's see, it's uh, b plus one. Ah. Inverse, I think, uh, hmm. minus here and plus here. I think, I think this is it. Yeah. So, so, so basically, you have inverse function. They are both monotonic, and uh, this is order isomorphism. Now, why does that matter? Well, you see, the I A plus is obviously directed. If you have two positive elements, you can just add them up uh, and, and get the upper bound. So, how do you show that lambda is directed? Well, you just take two elements, send them to positive elements, add them up, and send them back by this inverse transformation, and conclude uh, that, that uh, this is uh, indeed a directed set. So, all that remains to check is uh, the following. So, so, we need to check that if A is in A, then there exists some E in, okay, then right, we need some epsilons, right? Then for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists E in lambda such that norm of A minus EA is less than epsilon. Uh, Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, uh, if, let me just add one page here. So if, if A is uh, greater than zero, uh, then uh, you can use for continuous functional calculus uh, to, to construct E. So, so what is E? Well, uh, it will be just f of a, and what is f? I'll just draw the graph of the function. So uh, it is zero at zero. At epsilon, it is one, and it just stays one forever, and it's zero in the negative part. So if you multiply a by, by, by this, uh, you get uh, something uh, that is within a. So this is yet another standard trick, right? So it's uh, f of a, a. A, f of a times a minus a is normalized than epsilon. Now, uh, this is if a is zero, if, if a is uh, greater than zero. Uh, otherwise, we just use the fact uh, that, that uh, every element of our ceased algebra is a linear combination of five, uh, four, of four positive elements, right? Two self-adjoints, each self-adjoint is, is a difference of two positives. And uh, the statement holds. Okay, so we have approximate units. And we'll see uh, relatively soon what to do with them. Okay, no questions? Uh, right. Okay, so, so here is uh, first application of approximate units, ideals and quotients. Now, uh, ideal in cyst algebra, uh, there are all sorts of different ideas, but, but uh, unless uh, otherwise specified, uh, in this course, ideal is always going to be two-sided, norm-closed and self-adjoint ideal. Uh, as you can see, self-adjoint uh, is uh, barely visible because it's redundant. One can prove that two-sided norm-closed actually implies self-adjoint, but that doesn't matter. So uh, self-adjoint just means that uh, J is equal to J star. Right? Uh, now, if you have ideal like this, you can take a quotient Banner space, just know it, it's more close subspace, and uh, you can uh, also define uh, addition, multiplication, you can define adjoint because it's self adjoint. Uh, so you may see that at this lemma here uh, that states that every quotient of a ceased algebra is a ceased algebra again is a triviality. Well, think again. Uh, what is trivial uh, is that every quotient of a ceased algebra is a ceased algebra with involution, but what you need to check is the C star equality, right? And it's, it's not at all obvious why uh, this should hold in the quotient. 
uh, that is, it's not obvious uh, if you don't know about approximate units. You see J, uh, it is an ideal of A, I'll use this algebraic notation. So it's probably not a unit of C star algebra, but it has approximate unit. And now to check that C star equality holds in the quotient, you can just use approximate unit of J and basically transfer uh, approximate, uh, not approximate, uh, transfer C star equality that holds in A to uh, it holding in quotient. So if you're a logician, uh, you know, if you think of, of um, preservation theorems in model theory, well, basically this is a preservation theorem. This is a sentence uh, which asserts uh, that uh, C star equality holds uh, is preserved uh, by taking quotients. And quotients are going to be very important for us because uh, all of these massive C star algebras are uh, produced as uh, quotients. Any questions? Okay, so I mean, one quotient we could uh, right now take a look at. So B of H divided by K of H, that we'll be seeing this one a lot. It's so called Kalkin algebra. Uh, I should say that, that it was defined in 1942 by, by Kalkin, who was, I think, student of von Neumann. Uh, this may be his only paper. Uh, this was uh, defined before uh, gelfa neimark siegel theorem. So uh, it wasn't obvious uh, even what a C-star algebra was, but uh, Kalkin proved by bare hands uh, that, that uh, the instance of, of uh, GNS representation needed for this uh, is true. Namely that, that Kalkin algebra can be represented as algebra of uh, operators on some Hilbert space. He also proved that, that uh, Hilbert space is quite monstrous, but uh, we'll come back to that uh, later on. Uh, okay, so one more prerequisite and uh, then uh, we are talking. So uh, topologies on B of H and von Neumann algebras. Now, I, I'm not really joking here. I mean, when I say there are uncountably many important topologies, that, that's virtually true. I mean, that there is uh, basically every time uh, you think that, that uh, you got a grip on, on what are the important ones, uh, something new pops up. I'll just need two topologies on B of H. I'll need more topologies on, on other spaces, but on B of H, uh, we just need a strong operator topology, uh, which is uh, easy to describe. Uh, it's topology used by family of semi-norms. A goes to norm of X, C, so C is, uh, as I said, um, vector um, in, in this Hilbert space. So it's just the topology of pointwise convergence on H. So, so, um, um, Yep, that's, uh, that's the topology. And weak operator topology is induced by another family of semi-norms. Now what I wrote here is not a semi-norm because I forgot to put absolute value. Now it's a semi-norm. Uh, so you don't, now you fix uh, C and eta and uh, you uh, map A to, into this. Uh, this is inner product, right? So this is uh, inner product of vectors A, C and eta for C and eta in H. So uh, if you think of uh, operators as uh, giant matrices, which is a good way to think about them, uh, weak operator topology is really pointwise uh, convergence uh, of, um, of matrix entries, at least if you're looking only at uh, bounded nets. So let's say on, on the unit ball, if you look at operators of norm at most one, then we cooperate with topologies uh, norm of oh, sorry topology of a pointwise convergence of matrix entries. Uh, if you look at the topology of pointwise convergence of matrix entries uh, on the whole thing, then it's ultra weak topology. It's, it's, it's different from weak topology, but I don't think we'll need it. So, so never mind that. Now, uh, I guess uh, names are suggestive. Strong operator topology is stronger than weak operator topology, so it has more open sets. Uh, to see that, you just need to recall uh, two equalities. Uh, first is that norm. This is, I mean, I could have put here a little tool in subscripts so that the Hilbert space uh, uh, norm is just defined as square root uh, of the inner product vector itself. And uh, the other way around, uh, if you know what the norm is, I'll put a little two here as well. 
then uh, from so-called polarization identities, you can recover inner product. So if you haven't seen this before, again, uh, this is a good exercise to multiply this out and see that everything cancels. Uh, okay, um, no questions. So definition, uh, full Neumann algebra is a strongly closed unit of C star subalgebra of B of H. Uh, right, so, so every von Neumann algebra is a C star algebra. But uh, the other way around, uh, we don't have implication. Take uh, compact operators, for example, if H is infinite dimensional, uh, compact operators are dense uh, in, in a strong operator topology, uh, but uh, they are not, uh, well, no, not closed and not unital for that matter. Uh, remarkable effects that, that will not really need, but, but I should mention them. Uh, if instead of strongly closed, uh, if I said weakly closed, you would get the same definition. So these are very robust notions. Um, and uh, there is also algebraic way to define von Neumann algebras without mentioning topology at all. Uh, you just require that uh, algebra is unital and uh, that it is equal to its own double commutant. Now you just take everything that commutes with your operators and then take everything that commutes with those operators, you get your algebra back. So, so this was really a Fulman's theorem that is inspired uh, the entire subject of uh, what uh, he and Murray called uh, rings of operators. But again, uh, this is this course is about cist algebras. We just need quantum uh, algebras every now and then, uh, sporadically. So um, yeah, so I'm just saying what I need to say here. Uh, here is uh, one property of quantum algebras we are going to need uh, on Friday, definitely. Um, if M is a quantum algebra, and if A lambda is an increasing net of positive elements in M, which is bounded above by some positive element, then uh, it has supremum. So every bounded net of, uh, bounded directed net of positive elements has a supremum. And less importantly, uh, that supremum is equal to, to strong limit. Uh, this is false in C star algebras. Just take, uh, take for example, continuous functions on zero one. Here, positive means positive functions uh, whose range is positive. And, and it's very easy to define a uh, net uh, in here consisting of positive functions of norm at most one whose supremum is discontinuous. Um, uh, I'll just say one more thing here. Uh, this does not characterize von Neumann algebras. It uh, characterizes something called AW star algebras and uh, that class is different from phenomenon algebra, so although there is a very interesting open problem there, uh, but I have nothing to say about it, unfortunately, so I'll just uh, go on. Uh, okay, any questions? I see that I'm done with prerequisites, unless I forgot something. I think uh, that on this slide, we actually start finally. Right. Okay, so, so uh, massive cyst algebras, what do I mean by that? Okay, so here is a list of some of them. Ultra products, asymptotic sequence algebras, ultra, uh, ultra powers. You see that they're so important that I listed ultra products two times. What I wanted is ultra powers and coronas. Uh, you may have seen uh, these uh, before or may, maybe not. Um, let me just say uh, what, uh, uh, why should one uh, care about them? So uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, most mathematicians care about uh, objects which are very low in, in set theoretic hierarchy. Let's look at the V of omega plus 10 or something like that, which pretty much means separable cyst algebra. So they, they are the interesting ones. But now uh, if you have your separable cyst algebra A and you want to really understand it, uh, or, or if you have uh, you know, some, some morphism between two separable cyst algebras A and B, Quite often, uh, it is very uh, advantageous to, to somehow blow up, let's say, this target algebra B to something very large. I'll call it B to you, uh, and uh, look at 
embedding of A in, into that uh, big thing. So, so these B to U's are, are what I call massive cyst algebra. And uh, one gets to understand separable algebras much better by the way that, that they're they are sitting inside uh, these massive algebras, because these massive algebras have some quite remarkable properties. Uh, so you may ask uh, what is the formal definition of massive cyst algebra? Well, there is no formal definition, uh, but you know, it's one of those things that we know them when we see them. Uh, and uh, right, so this is just repeating what I just said. They are constructed from a single separable cyst algebra or perhaps from a sequence of separable cyst algebras uh, in a canonical way. Sometimes one also uses an ultra filter on natural numbers uh, to construct ultra powers. And most important, I mean, the reason why I'm doing this and not somebody else uh, is uh, that uh, many of the basic properties of uh, these algebras are sensitive to the choice of the action of set theory. We we'll eventually get to that. Uh, so, okay, so let's start. Uh, first, uh, let's define multiplier algebras. These are not massive yet, uh, just a disclaimer. So they, they are big, but, but uh, not massive yet. So here is a definition uh, and ideal, uh, we said it's essential if uh, for every non-zero element, uh, aj is not zero. So your ideal is, is not just sitting in some small corner of your algebra, but it's somehow filling up the, the whole uh, thing. Uh, and, and here is the canonical example. You know, whenever applies, it is good to see a, a billion example. So this is a billion. So uh, you have a compact house of space Y, here it is. And uh, X is a subset of Y, uh, which is dense and locally compact. So you know, one, uh, I mean, for the first run, it makes sense to look at this. So Y is closed uh, unit interval and X is a half open unit interval. All right, so, so it's um, X is, is uh, dense and locally compact. Now uh, look at this ideal J, uh, all the functions in C of Y, which vanish outside of Y, right? So all the functions which uh, vanish on uh, this set here. Now X is dense, of course, I don't know how to draw a dense X, but, but uh, you get the idea. Right, so, so in this particular case, you can see what, what uh, that would be. Uh, those would be functions uh, that, uh, at zero, assume value zero, right? Uh, this is an ideal, it's essential. In this particular case, uh, the quotient will just be complex numbers, right? Uh, just given by the value of function at uh, zero. And, and uh, this is, uh, this J is an example of an essential ideal of C of Y, uh, right? Why? Well, because X is dense. So if you take uh, any uh, function uh, any non-zero function, it has to be non-zero somewhere on X because X is dense. And uh, from there uh, you conclude that, that it does hit ideal non-trivially. So I said uh, J is isomorphic to C zero of X. Now, uh, so, so in this context, let me draw it once again. So Y, X is sitting as a locally compact and dense subspace of Y with induced topology. Uh, y is what is called the compactification of X, something that you may have seen before. Uh, and uh, what our goal is, uh, the goal of defining multiple algebras, uh, they're really non-commutative analogs of the check stone compactification, sometimes also called stone check, depending on whether you think of Chuck as coming before S or after S. Um, uh, so uh, here is in a tiny print, uh, the definition of uh, what is uh, check stone compactification. So uh, this beta X, you look at all continuous bounded functions from X into complex numbers. And uh, you want uh, each one of those functions to extend continuously uh, to, to, to this check stone compactification. Now, uh, in my example, with half open interval and the closed interval, uh, there is only one compactification really, but if you remove point in the middle of the interval, for example, then you would have uh, different things. 
so anyways, so this is uh, something that we'll be coming back to. Uh, and uh, again, uh, what I want to, to, to do right now is start from this ideal, from, from uh, non unit of C-star algebra, and then produce something, some other C-star algebra inside which uh, this R algebra fits as an essential idea. And, and that something is as big as possible. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay, so again, this uh, notation, B less or equal than C means that B is a C star subalgebra of C. Uh, now, suppose that A is already given as a subalgebra of B of H, then the idealizer of A, just as, as defined in algebra, uh, is all elements in B of H, such that B A is subset of A and A B is subset of uh, A. Uh, I mean, if it's not clear what I mean by this, B A is set of all B A for A and A, and similarly for A B. It takes a moment to, to see that, that uh, this is a vector subspace uh, that is closed in the multiplication and adjoints that why have it on both sides, uh, and it's also non closed. So, so uh, M is by itself a C star algebra and uh, A is an ideal by, by definition, right? So, um, and uh, also if we assure that A was non-degenerate, uh, which means uh, this here, that, that uh, the orthogonal, the annihilator, right? So this is called annihilator. Of, of A, if uh, annihilator is trivial, uh, then uh, the ideal is essential. All right, so, so, so you know, if, if you just have your A sitting inside some corner of B of H, there are going to be many elements which annihilate it, which, which uh, just end up in the idealizer for no good reason. We just don't want that. So you want uh, A to be uh, big enough. Uh, and uh, here's a little exercise uh, that, yeah, if you haven't seen this, it is a good exercise. Uh, if A is a C0 of X for X, which is non-compact, uh, then M is actually continuous functions on beta X using definition from previous slides. So that uh, every function in C of X has, every bounded continuous function on C of X has uh, continuous, has an extension uh, inside uh, M. I should say here, uh, if you haven't seen this before, it may not even be obvious how to embed C0 of X into B of H. But uh, anyway, uh, that, that's also part of the exercise. Okay, so this is idealizer. And uh, well, one thing that is not obvious at all is uh, why should M depend only on A? Uh, because uh, you see already for separable C-star algebras, uh, representation theory is quite a rich subject and uh, sufficiently complicated uh, C-star algebras have a very complicated uh, representation theory uh, that it can be represented in, in continuum many different ways. Uh, and even uh, representations are not classifiable by countable structures if, if you know some discrete set theory. So, so, so uh, there is no reason a priori why uh, this M should depend on, on A and not on the way that, that we embedded A to B of H, but it is actually true. It doesn't. So, so M depends only on A. Uh, there are at least three ways of proving this. Um, uh, and uh, constructing the multiple algebra of A, uh, thick completion multipliers and Hilbert modules. Now it is generally agreed by experts that this is the right way, Hilbert modules. However, that said, I'll do this. Uh, basically because I want to avoid uh, too much algebra uh, that, that is not necessary. So if you really want to understand what is going on, if, if you like this, uh, it is definitely a good idea to, to look at um, a root uh, or to multipliers by using Hilbert modules, but I'll just use the shortcut and do it in the fastest possible way uh, that, that that's going to be, um, uh, well, basically that's going to work for us. So uh, thick completion. And now at this point, I come back to what I said earlier, uh, that, that my uh, book contains certain number of typos. So far I have only finitely many. Um, 
what I'm saying right now, uh, it's not done uh, in the right way in the book. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, here we are. So uh, if you have normatizable topological space, uh, then convergence can be defined in terms of nets or in terms of filters. Uh, mostly operator algebras prefer nets, um, but there is one uh, place where filters, at least one place, where, where filters actually make uh, much more sense and uh, we are uh, getting there. Uh, so let's uh, just uh, see what the filter is. Here X is just a set. Uh, and F oh, yes, uh, P of X, I didn't define P of X. So P of X is set of all of Y, such that Y is subset of X, right? the power set of X. So family of subsets of X uh, is a filter. Uh, if you have these properties, it's closed upwards. It's closed under intersection of its elements. And also if you want a proper filter, which we do, uh, you don't want empty set to be there. Uh, one uh, example and, and really the example for what we are doing right now, uh, think of your topological space X, fix a point little X in there and look at neighborhood filter. Uh, I didn't say open neighborhoods, I said neighborhoods. So look at all subsets of X which contain an open neighborhood of X. That is a filter. And, and that basically also gives you an idea of, of why I'm looking at filters here, because uh, you see filters which are not of this form, uh, they point to, to missing points in your space. So that, that's how you want to, be, uh, to, to define a completion of a space. Uh, okay, no questions. No. Uh, all right. So uh, standard uh, notion from, from function analysis, weak topology used by a family of semi-norms, uh, right? So you have your topological vector space or just a vector space. Uh, and you have family of uh, functions which are just like norms, except that their kernels may, may be uh, big. Uh, that's from your semi norms. You just define the initial topology, right? The minimal topology, which makes all those functions continuous. Um, so, suppose that we are in that situation, and uh, F is a filter on set X. Here's the definition F converges to, to some X. We can just write it as, as this. If the obvious things happen, the thing happens for each one of those semi norms, for each epsilon. Uh, this open neighborhood uh, corresponding to, to rho and epsilon belongs to the filter. Uh, Cauchy filters are also defined in a natural way. So again, for every seminar, for every epsilon, uh, there is a set in the filter. So that that uh, difference between any L2 elements of this set uh, has seminar less than epsilon. And uh, we say that X is complete with respect to this topology used by N if every Cauchy filter on X converges. This is equivalent to saying that every Cauchy net on X converges. Uh, but uh, the reason why I'm looking at filters here and not nets is that uh, if you fix uh, your space X, uh, the set of all filters on X is a set. Uh, it is a subset of power set of power set of X, which is not too bad. Uh, the all nets on X don't form a set because in the definition of net, you have an arbitrary directed set and there are just too many arbitrary directed sets. So, so this is a mistake that I'm referring uh, that I just wrote, well, it's obvious uh, that you just construct completion. So it, it's not that obvious, but anyway, um, kind of. But, but anyway, so I, I was, I mean, I, I would appreciate the reference. So the only reference I was able to find is, is excellent, but uh, it's not uh, an official published book. So it's uh, Gabriel Nagy's lecture notes. Here is a link uh, in which he does uh, exactly this. He, he defines a completion of arbitrary topological vector space with respect to family symbols. Uh, all right, so now what remains is just to tell you what seminars am I talking about. Uh, so back to uh, C star algebras. Here, remember, A is sitting inside M, although this is interesting even if A is uh, just sitting by itself. And now uh, to every element H in A, we associate two semi-norms on this bigger algebra, uh, the left and the right. 
So uh, you just multiply by H and take norm. You can check that this is semi-norm. It, uh, uh, so uh, we want to look at weak topology induced by these semi-norms. I say the weakest topology uh, that makes all of these semi-norms uh, continuous. Uh, it is called the A-strict topology uh, or just the strict topology if A is clear from the context. Uh, I should say again, uh, disclaimer, uh, A-strict, uh, I'm probably the only person who uses this terminology. Uh, it it uh, just was important for me to be specific about what, uh, what strict topology we are talking about. Uh, one uh, easy fact, uh, if A is unital, if A is unital, then this is just a norm topology because you can just take H to be equal to one and uh, everything collapses, you just have the norm. So the interesting case is if A is not unital and uh, if A is not unital, uh, you don't need to look at all elements of A. It suffices uh, to take elements of any fixed approximate unit for A, it's an exercise. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so, so at this point, I guess you, you see uh, what point I'm driving at. Uh, you give me non-unital ceased algebra. I look at uh, this family of all semi-norms induced by uh, elements of X on the left and on the right, and I take its completion. And I want to look at that algebra. So, uh, and uh, here is lemma. Uh, the completion M of A of A in this uh, strict topology is, uh, is actually a ceased algebra. It has a structure of unital ceased algebra uh, and moreover, A is an essential ideal in M of A. Uh, so I'll just sketch the proof. So basically you just look at uh, all filters uh, on A, uh, which are Cauchy and they take a natural equivalence relation on them. Uh, and uh, and uh, mod out, right? So, so it's a, a straightforward thing. So the algebraic operations are defined in natural way. This agrees with, with addition, with multiplication, with the adjoint. Uh, again, norm uh, may not be obvious. You see, uh, once you're done with this, you just have some algebra uh, that contains a uh, note, uh, A embeds naturally into M of A, but by just basically, I just uh, send every element to, to a constant uh, filter, right? So it's basically the principal filter uh, that, that is generated by, by, by this element. Uh, so one needs to, to define the norm. And uh, this is actually similar to what we did in case of quotients. So if you have F, which is a bounded Cauchy filter in A, the norm is defined uh, like this. So uh, you take supremum over all elements of approximate unit and supremum over all uh, elements in the filter and infimum of E times B. One has to check that this works. Uh, I'll uh, leave it to you to check. And uh, this uh, turns uh, M of A into multiplier algebra. Now I'm basically running out of time, but I would like to finish uh, this. So let me know, please, before I go ahead. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I can uh, talk uh, for hour and a half, but I understand uh, that it may be inconvenient for some of you. Let me know uh, if you would rather have me stop at, at uh, 4.15, you can, uh, you know, text me if, if you feel embarrassed to say that uh, it's okay. But uh, if, if nobody stops, no, I'll just continue talking. Um, okay, nobody's stopping me. Um, okay, so uh, M of A is this multiplier algebra of A. As you can see, I skipped some details here, but, but uh, it is a good exercise. And let's, instead of, of going over details, uh, take a look at uh, what are the examples here. Okay, so, so here are uh, the examples. So if X is locally compact Hausdorff space, then the multiplier algebra of C zero X is continuous functions on beta X. That's a nice uh, exercise. Multiplier algebra of uh, compact operators is exactly B of H. 
So, so uh, this is also good exercise. Uh, and it, it's very instructive exercise. You know, every element of B of H does define a Cauchy filter on the compacts. Uh, and uh, there is nothing else, basically. If two, uh, if two elements define the same Cauchy filter, they are the same operator. Uh, the third example uh, will be coming back to this over and over. If you give me a sequence of unit assist algebras, even something like uh, n by n matrices for the nth one, then uh, you can take direct sum. So what is direct sum? Well, uh, just all infinite sequences of these algebras that in norm converge to zero. Let me write it down. The direct sum of Bn is equal to all sequences a n such that in norm a n converges to zero. The multiplier algebra of that is just the product. And this is uh, just infinity product, uh, L infinity product. So product is all sequences a n uh, such that supremum of their norms is finite. Uh, it is important that BNs are unital. If they are not unital, then this is a much, much more complicated algebra, uh, but uh, we will not uh, need it. So uh, these are uh, multiplier algebras. And let me see, I think that I'm basically, oh yes, right, so I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so here is uh, the reason why I defined uh, von Neumann algebras today. So uh, if N is a von Neumann algebra, just think n equals to b of h if you forgot the definition. So it's really, I'll just need this case. Uh, and if a is a C star subalgebra, uh, which is non degenerate, so it's annihilator if just zero, then a is a n is a strictly complete. Uh, the reason I'm not going to prove this, I just want, want to draw a picture here. You see, if you look at uh, b, actually, Maybe it's a good idea if, if I remind you what uh, those, uh, uh, what completeness we're talking about. So lambda A is norm of AB and rho of A of B is norm of BA. So you just need to check uh, that, that uh, if, um, if you have uh, Cauchy net uh, with respect to, to these, that that Cauchy net converges. And now the trick again is, excuse me, it suffices to look at the positive part uh, of the algebra. Uh, and uh, if you're in positive part, then you can also uh, look only at the corners. So let's say that E is a approximate unit in A and take some little E in, in E. And look at this corner, E and E. It is actually the same as E A E. And uh, your Cauchy net is going to converge to something here. So to each element of the approximate unit, you associate some element of your algebra. And all that you need to do is put them together. But to put them together, you exactly need uh, the net monotone completeness that uh, bounded uh, directed family of positive elements has a supremum in the von Neumann algebra. And that supremum is the limit. So, uh, so uh, that's pretty much that. Uh, okay, and uh, here is uh, one more proposition. I think I'll just prove this and, uh, and, and stay quality and then I'll stop. So uh, suppose that, that you have a non-degenerate faithful representation, right? So faithful mean trivial kernel, non-degenerate means uh, annihilator is trivial. I'll start drawing it. Here's A, P, and here is B of H, here's A. Then uh, this P has a unique extension to a representation of the multiplier algebra. So here is M of A sitting on top of A. Uh, and uh, this, so here is the image of A. So uh, the image of multiplier algebra is exactly equal to the idealizer of, of, of P of A. Uh, proof of this, uh, once you parse the statement is, is basically a triviality. Oops. How did I do this? I'm sorry, uh, I just pressed the wrong button as you see. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, so, but now, now you'll just see the whole lecture on Ravo. Oh, so, okay, sorry about this. I'm not sure what they pressed exactly. Ah, yeah. So, um, so if you have some element here of M of A, let's call it B, uh, that then again, uh, because M of A is the completion, then downstairs here, you have some filter FB, which is filter on A, which converges to B. So what you do is, well, you just apply your P, maybe you should use in different colors. So let's say uh, filter FB is red, uh, you apply P to send it here. Now this is filter again. And now because B of H is a four Neumann algebra uh, by, by the previous lemma, uh, it is uh, aesthetically complete. So that there is this limit. So, so there is something, some B prime uh, that uh, FB con converges to, but that B prime is exactly what uh, P tilde B should be. Right, so just to take B decompose it and send it back. And then you just need to check that, that indeed uh, this uh, respects algebraic operations, which is again straightforward uh, if once one goes uh, over um, uh, the proof of this. And uh, finally, uh, this is equal to the idealizer of P of A. Again, I'll just leave it to you. It is important for this last part uh, that the presentation is uh, non-degenerate. So uh, what this implies uh, is that uh, M of A, this uh, idealizer indeed does not depend on representation. As long as representation is faithful and on the generate, you get the same thing. And uh, M of A is canonically isomorphic to this idealizer. And uh, this is uh, M of A is what we call uh, the multiplier algebra. Right, I should stop here. So yeah, so, so thank you. I think uh, I should stop here and uh, let me know if you have any questions. As I said, I'll, I'll be happy to hang around uh, to answer questions, if any. If any. And again, uh, I'm going to post uh, both um, uh, the slides and uh, I guess recording. I don't think I can post the recording, but uh, Fields Institute is going to post the recording to, to their website. Welcome. I want questions. I want questions. No, no, thank you. You're welcome. But... <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, that is a good question. So, Piotr, uh, let me. So, I'll put a link right here. Oh. Oh, this is long. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, oops. I should send this to everyone. Uh, how do I send that? Right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe this is a good moment to say, uh, you all probably received an email from the fields uh, stating that, that uh, we can use some uh, website with, with some shady name, hireme.something. Uh, I'll not be using it. So, so if you're taking this course for credit, uh, you can just email me the, the, the assignments. I think it's, it's, it's easier uh, than worrying about uh, passwords and all that. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, then uh, you can still send me questions by email and I'll see you on Friday. Uh, maybe I have- Yes, sure, sure. Go, go ahead, go ahead, yes. Um, so I'm just confused about, um, maybe if, can, if you can go back in the slides, I think it was around uh, slide um, 54, I think, something like that. 54, okay. Okay, here. Um, Still a bit back. One more slide back. 
Here. And one more slide, please. <laughs> yeah, it was one, one more slide, I think, Beck. Sorry. Uh... Uh, something. Oh. Okay, I hope the time. Can you? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can still hear you. Okay, uh, because uh, my my uh, battery on my laptop was about to die, and uh, the, the, then uh, my laptop decided that, that the best way to handle that was to, to knock out my my headphones. Okay. So I was uh, anyway. So I, so uh, is this? I, I'm sorry, but I think it was uh, one more slide. But... <laughs> Sure, not long, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> as many as you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's here. So I'm just confused. Um, so it's probably a stupid question, but why do you, why can you um, only consider bounded Cauchy filters? Because, so, so when you say bounded, you mean for the strict topology, right? Sorry. Uh, no, I mean uh, norm bounded. I norm. mean, you know, I, I just mean, you know, the, uh, just basically look at the A in A. Such that the uh, norm of A is at most some K, whatever. So that's fixed, basically K ball. Just filters which sit inside uh, some fixed ball of your Swiss algebra. Because you definitely don't want, uh, you know, you want everything uh, uh, in your multiplier algebra to have a norm. And uh, if your element comes from, from A, it, it has to be the same norm. I remember it's. It's this property that, that uh, every star homomorphism is automatically contraction. So, so in your completion, you only, you only consider the con the completion only consists of bounded Cauchy filters, or or you allow all Cauchy filters? Uh, or... You just you only need bounded Cauchy filters, only bounded. And again, you know, it's the usual uh, disclaimer. It's not really filters; it's the equivalent classes of filters. Right? If you have two different filters, you identify them. Uh, if, if there are differences, uh, right? I, I never actually wrote this, so may, maybe it's a good, a good moment to write this. Um, sorry, uh, here. So, so basically, you want uh, to identify filters uh, F1 and F2 uh, if, uh, if, if what? If uh, for every row, uh, and for every epsilon, there are sets x1 in f1, and there is set x2 in f2. I hope I get this right. Uh, such that that, that uh, so like row. For every, for every neighborhood, you get right. an element in the one, an element in the two, such that there are differences in the neighborhood. Exactly, yes. So exactly. for every a1, exactly, yes. For every a2 in x2, the row of a1 minus a2 is less than half. I forgot that. There is x1. So uh, this is like an epsilon, right? So, so you identify pairs like this. So it's the equivalence classes uh, of, of, of such filters, mm -hmm. uh, which are elements of the multiple algebra. So I'm not sure, is this answering the question? Yes, so, but I'm just confused in the definition of completion. I know I would allow all Cauchy filters and it's not just clear on first sight for me that it make no uh, difference if you, if you only Take the norm yeah, bar. Uh, is that is a probably. good point. That, that, that's a good point. Uh, and uh, my guess is that it should not make difference. So mm -hmm. basically, if you have an, uh, I mean, even if your filter contains uh, unbounded uh, sets, uh, that in order for it to be Cauchy, yes, in order, yes, that, that, that's an exercise. That's an exercise. Um, so uh, every Cauchy filter concentrates on a bounded set. And you know, assume otherwise. Basically, you can produce. Um, yeah, but that's an exercise. Uh, you know, basically, it's it's not even uniform boundedness uh, principle or anything uh, deep like that. So 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 uh, just the point is uh, that that uh, in order to convert to, to be Cauchy, you have to decide uh, what your norm is. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. So I see there was another question uh, from Pedro. I had a question. Does this uh, notion of multiple algebra relate to the multiple algebra built? Yes, it is the same thing. That that's, I think I said it at some point that uh, there are three ways to, to define it. 
and uh, that was uh, that that was the second uh, way. Yes, it's an exercise to prove that these are the same. Yes, thank you. So, so, uh, so as I said, uh, this is an important construction, and to me, uh, just uh, this seemed to be the most natural way towards uh, going straight to, to to what I really need. Uh, double centralizers. Uh, I think I call them something else. But uh, okay, I said multipliers. Okay, yeah, the, 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 I, I meant double centralized. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that's how uh, Greg Peterson did it uh, in his uh, C star just neuromorphism group. I mean, it, it's, it's an exercise to, to just see exactly why, why these are uh, the same. Okay. All right. So, uh, um, Elias, before you go, I yes. I, I just wanted to uh, ask, like, I I wanted to suggest everyone, uh, the, maybe it's the students who wanted to have the tuto tutorial, um, maybe on Friday, Wait. 3 p.m. or um, if that works for everybody. Uh, I'm sure that it's well. Actually, I don't know, but but ah. uh, it may not work uh, for people who are in Europe uh, unless they like to spend their Friday nights uh, at, at uh, tutorial. Uh. Uh, uh, oh yes, sorry. I was actually uh, thinking. Um, you're right. That would be that would be late in the evening. So um, uh, then then I'll maybe yeah. I'll suggest some sometime earlier during the day. Uh, so I don't know whether you have access to, to the list. Uh, well, okay, uh, so since I, I already uh, mentioned to say it's an email, you can maybe just send it to chat again. Uh, basically, if, you, if you're interested in tutorial, you can just send an email to Said, and then Said you can just form some sort of uh, what you call Doodle, uh, Doodle poll and, and, and figure out uh, what is convenient time. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Uh, right. Okay. All right. All right so thanks everyone, Thank and uh, see you on Friday. See you. Bye. Bye.